My name is Stan Wisseman. I'm with OpenTex. I'm Chief Technologist in their Cybersecurity Enterprise Division. And today I'm going to talk about, um, well, first off, I'm going to sort of try to set the stage of why we are here talking about this and give you some context. Um, we also had a survey conducted, and I'm going to be going through the results of that survey about the, the pain folks feel on the intake process for open source components. Um, give you some, a bit of a case study, uh, you know, reflect on ourselves as far as an independent software vendor, the pain that we have, you know, experience given the number of products we have. Um, and then if there's time, give you a little demo. So um, again, a, a bit of the context. So open text, you may be familiar with the company primarily as an information management company. Uh, products like Documentum, Core, et cetera. Uh, but they have been purchasing a, a number of cybersecurity related brands in the last five to seven years. Um, so they, they have the whole range now from you know, end users all the way through SMB and now large enterprise. And around a year and a half ago, um, they acquired Microfocus. And Microfocus had some enterprise cybersecurity brands, uh, including some around application security like Fortify. And one of those brands was Debricked. Debricked um, is a company that got started in 2018. They spun out of uh, the University of Lund and, in Sweden. And um, they have a focus on trying to ensure that the use of open source software is safe and secure. And so they have a um, SCA, Software Composition Analysis Tool or Service. Um, and one of the things that they consistently have heard over the last you know, few years as far as um, pain points of their customers is the intake process. And, you know, they, they wanted to study that problem and better understand exactly what was going on with it and as far as how we could possibly help improve that process. Um, and so they went ahead and, and con, you know, commissioned a study and Forrester Consulting uh, just completed that study, I think it was like two months ago. Um, and, you know, the, the idea of this, again, was to have an external party, you know, look at the problem, try to, you know, better understand the, you know, the criteria that's being used for intake, um, the, 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 the different challenges that people are feeling, et cetera. And so we, you know, try to get a pretty broad swath of participants. They had over 300 participants in the study, um, different regions, you know, granted almost 50% from the U.S., um, but you had, you know, UK, France, and Germany also represented a wide variety of different roles from the C-suite as well as developers and everything in between. Um, we had different sectors in the industry represented, not only technology, but also retail, manufacturing, business, healthcare, et cetera. So it was, it was I think, representative of a variety of different um, parts of the community. And then we had a, a large number of, uh, of companies, organizations that are over 5,000 employees. So large organizations as well. So the, the first thing we wanted to look at was, you know, the criterion that was used in the intake process itself. And if you look on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see that those bars represent the um, most important or very important criteria, and the top two are associated with security. So security was the, the top criteria that they were most concerned about in the intake process. And then as you move down, you have compliance with the open source policy that the organization had. Uh, that was at 84%. Um, does it meet the functional needs of what you're trying to do? And that's 70, 64%. Um, my glasses are my bifocal, trifocals, to be honest. I'm having a hard time reading the stats here. Um, you know, does it match their internal competency? Is it in the, the kind of language or framework that they're used to developing in? Um, is, the, is the software compliant with the licenses and the, and the rules there? And there's some overlap between the license compliance and the open source software policy, because the policy typically has something in there as well about what kind of licenses are appropriate or not for the organization or to avoid. Um, and then health of the project, et cetera. So those are the different criteria. And I'm just curious, does that resonate with you? Do you guys agree with those as being the criteria? Is there anything that you think is missing as something important? You would think, right? But yeah. <laughs> right. 
right, right. And the fact that it's sort of like in the middle of the list is, is interesting, huh? But yeah, so that's a good observation. And so the next part of this was, okay, well, what happens if you're you know, non-compliant and you, you find that issue out? And what's the negative impact? And the bars represent the, you know, or what's the negative impact of going through this, this process, of so the intake process? And the, the, the dark bar is those that indicates that it takes more than four hours a week to do that. Um, and then the very large or negative impact is the lighter green bar. So again, just finding out the basic metrics or insights on a project is taking organizations or individuals are saying 27% are saying it's over four hours a week just to find the basic information about a project. Um, understanding the license compliance, 24% are saying it's over four hours a week. So it goes down that list of, you know, the approval, waiting for approval of what you want to use is taking a long time. That's a painful process. Um, if you're dealing with something that's non-optimal, so it, it is you know, no longer supported, or end of life, um, how do you actually deal with that? And that's another time sink. So there, there are a, a number of different issues that um, are causing pain. And when you look at some of these more specifically, you know, like finding the metrics on something, you think, well, there are a lot of tools out there that can help you find that, right? But if the open source policy in the organization doesn't make it clear what the source of truth is, each developer is going to leverage whatever tool they find, and you know, they're habitually using, and they find you know, that is valuable to them, and it may be completely different results depending on the tool, right? And so this is difficult to read, I know, but the one on the left of the screen you know, well, let me set the stage. So let's say you're, you're trying to ensure that you're compliant with the policy rule indicating that the, the health of the project is, is, is good, um, that it's, it's going to be maintained, right? And so you're looking to find that out. And the one on the left over there has 10 out of 10 for maintenance. Now, the one in the middle um, has a different kind of scoring. It has, indicates that there's one contributor for that project or the same project. And the one over here on the right, there are no contributors associated with that project. So again, if, if you're trying to ensure that you're um, only consuming and taking in the components that are being maintained, there may be a bit of confusion as to really whether or not you're getting what you want. Um, and the developers are trying to struggle through that process as well, trying to make sure that they, get, you know, they aren't selecting something that's going to be um, a challenge later on. Understanding licenses is, is complex. Um, you know, there are tools out there, you know, SCA, again, software composition analysis is a great way of figuring that out, but that's after the code has already been ingested and integrated in. So you're, you're not really getting help at the intake process when you're using an SCA tool. Um, and, you know, the sort of the approach organizations take many times is education. They, they have an, like an annual education of developers on, on license rules and what's acceptable and what's not. But let's face it, many times that is at a high level and the, it, it, it's in the details that you can get tripped up. Um, and so the developers may not really have the tools they need to understand what is truly acceptable and license and what's not. Um, and, you know, I think that the, uh, the result is that many times you, you're having to, to pass it on to legal or the open source project office, to program office to help have them make that call or the CTO, um, whoever to act, you know, there's, there's some kind of approval process that takes place that could be pretty long and extended. And that's another pain point. You know, you have a, on the bar on the top, you can't read it necessarily very well from there, but you know, a, a, an example approval process is you're, you're doing some kind of research on your own. There's a technical review. There may be a legal review, a security review. They may be in parallel. They may be sequential, um, but it's typically a manual process. Um, there may be, you know, emailing PDF files around each other, right? So it's, it, it could be um, cumbersome. Um, and, you know, the other, the other challenge many times is that process is done for 
everything the same, right? So you could have a non-production library that you want to actually get approved, um, and it's going through the same process as a business critical applications, you know, use of an open source framework. And that that latter one may take four months, but the library shouldn't take four months to approve, right? I mean, so it, it's, a, it's sort of like that, that same process is being used many, in many cases. Um, and, and one of the unfortunate ramifications is it really sort of like is a downer <laughs> on the developers as they're waiting for these approval processes. Um, and sometimes they don't necessarily want to go through it and, you know, and go through the pain. Um, and so the other, other challenge that we talked about earlier was the selection of sub optimal components, meaning you may not have had enough time to research adequately, or you had misinformation. Um, what are the ramifications of, of, of ultimately having a component that's not being maintained by a community or it's end of life? Um, you know, you may have to have some kind of workaround. You may have to ultimately replace the component after it's in production. Um, there may be other time sinks involved as far as how do you actually deal with it. But, you know, you have over 50% here, that first bar, um, maintaining dead and open source components as being a, a large or very large impact. Um, and the second bar is working with non-optical open source, and the last one is exchanging the components. So again, you know, almost 50% on, uh, on all of them, or over 50% on all of them, is, is definitely an indication that it's a pain point for folks. And... You know, communication's important. I mean, again, if, if organizations are doing an annual training, they probably are saying, well, here's where you can find the open source policy, here's where you can get it. But developers don't necessarily remember, you know, where they need to go, right? Um, and once they find it, you know, being able to get through it. And there are a couple of examples here. Company A has a very thorough policy, 80 pages. It's everything you could ever think of, you know? You know, whether or not licenses are appropriate or not, where the you know, security, what's acceptable, um, you know, the actual, um, you know, issues as far as IP, you know, everything. Then another company has a two-pager. You know, please ensure that you're, you're, you're applying with the, the license of the software and um, don't use a GPL. <laughs> so, you know, it, you, 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 could, you could have extremes, right? And, and, the, and the developers are left trying to, even if they find the policy, understand what they need to do. So that sort of gets through the, the, the ramifications of some of that negative pain. How are people actually doing? So what this is representing is where they actually were able to identify issues with the open source. 27% succeeded using these kind of processes up front in identifying non-compliant open source software. That's great. 41% used you know, SCA or some kind of manual review to identify it after they've already ingested it. Then you're getting to the point where you're saying, wow, is this really, you know, this is not effective, this is not working. 28% found it during testing or coding very late in the process before they actually found it. And then 4% complete fail, right? And it's like, okay, you're already in production and that's when you find it. Yeah, that's not good. Now, this is again, a survey of around 300 to 400 people. Have you guys had similar experiences of finding it later in the development process? I see some heads shaking yes. Um, and I, and, and I, I guess the premise is that 27% should be 100% or close to 100%. You should be able to find those issues early on at the intake process and not have to experience that pain and finding it later. Um, and, and that's what we're, we're ultimately arguing for. Um, and, and, and the consequences, obviously, of, of, of not finding these issues are things like wasted time, right? You're having to, to fix poor code, um, replacing components, et cetera. You have higher development costs. You have frustrated developers, which I think should be number one. You know, the fact that the developers get, you know, annoyed that they have to redo rework. Um, they should have understood, they should have gotten, been able to get it right the first time as opposed to have to redo things. Um, you have impact potentially to the development cycle itself and technical debt you may have to deal with. 
and ultimately lower code quality. Um, and so one of the results of this study, we, you know, we were probing about automation. You know, is, you know, if we automated this intake process, is this something that would be beneficial? And the answer was yes. I mean, if you can automate this, this would help. You know, and so the benefits of automation, as far as what the, you know, the participants of the survey said, um, the number one sort of goes back to that first thing we talked about earlier. They thought security, dealing with that and making sure you're compliant with the security rules was the top priority as far as what you can get out of the automation. Um, they also said that, you know, developer productivity, again, addressing some of those negative impacts as far as the slowing down of the development life cycle, the rework. If you can in automate this process, that would reduce a lot of that. Um, again, shorter time to market, cost reduction, uh, less waited, wasted time on dependencies, and less frustration for the developers. And so, you know, again, some of the key capabilities that you're looking for when you're automating this process are to do that security check, to actually have an approval workflow that gives you the ability to assign, you know, who's going to be doing what. You can track it. You can communicate those decisions efficiently. You know, again, workflow is what everybody is doing nowadays, and so it's, it's obvious. Automate the health check of the community. Have that single pane of glass so that everybody can see that, yes, we agree that this is what the community health is and not have disparate kind of perspectives on that from the different developers and the different tools they use. Have an automated way of doing the license check and, and ensuring that it meets your policy. And then ultimately, do it in a way that the, the developers are, are expecting it, you know, most valuable to them, uh, and reduces the friction for them. So this is a, a, a bit of a case study. Um, so I came from Microfocus. OpenText purchased us around, um, I don't know, 16, 16 months ago. And so I haven't updated this information, but I had gathered this information before about our process and our use of open, open source uh, software. And I thought it'd just be of interest to folks. So again, we had, in Microfocus alone, over 300 products. And that's over 400 releases into production a year. Um, we had thousands of different um, versions that were released every year, um, 10,000 and more of open source libraries in use. So you had to deal with all the different security issues, et cetera. So the process for the longest time was a manual one. They had designated within each product team one developer who was in charge of registering every third party component open source or otherwise. And there was a, a, a process of, you know, describing the purpose, the use, I mean, you know, all that stuff, the fine, the, you know. And that was submitted to these inbound technology managers and they would review and approve or disapprove, right? And there were on average like 10 per year per product. And that's again, an average. But that's like 30,000 manual reviews. And that doesn't even account for the trans, you know, the uh, transitive dependencies. It just, it was just unwieldy, you know. And so, companies like Microfocus and now OpenText, we use open source. We use, we have third-party components that we we leverage, and you have to ensure that you're not exposing the the company, the organization, to risk, right? And you have to have some kind of process. And so, you know, we are motivated to automate this process as well. And so part of this is, you know, allowing for a creation of, of policies that could be um, put in place to check the security, the health of the community, as well as the um, open light source licenses. And so you want to have those kind of policies automated and you want to be able to quickly check them and give you some kind of feedback. Um, you know, again, the, the hope is you can do it in a way that the developers can find easy to use. And so, you know, the, the idea is that you can provide this feedback in a way that they can automatically tell whether or not it be approved or disapproved. And, and you know, there, there could be examples where it's like, okay, this is a big enough decision. We have to do something more. But you want to make that um, feedback loop really tight 
Um, and then you want to have these rules triggered when they're looking at the different software. And I think, let me just break out and I'll give you an example of how this looks. So this is the product that they rolled out around a month ago called Open Source Select. And it allows you to scan our database of, of, of different open source projects out there. Um, let me just say that, you know, to your point, I want to look at a, a Python project because that's one of the technology that I want to look at. And I want to look at maybe a web framework. And let's look at Flask as an example. So I'm, I'm given feedback that, you know, the, the contributors and the popularity and the security all look good at the top level. Now I can drive down a little deeper so I can look at the contributor health as far as, you know, again, the efficiency, the diversity, the activity level. You know, it's a nice little spider diagram, gives you a, a good aspect as far as the different kinds of characteristics we're looking at. The popularity, you know, ultimately like the GitHub stars or, you know, the, the number of act activity of the community. Um, you know, and the security aspects. So that's all well and good. I mean, this, this is helpful, but I still don't necessarily know if that's compliant with my policy, right? And so you're able to actually create rules. Ah, look at that. I have to log back in. I waited too long. And so I've created several rules. Um, I've created a rule associated with the contributors. I need to have at least a score of 25 or the, the pipeline's gonna fail. Um, I, I did a security rule saying the score has to be at least a 50. Um, otherwise, there'll be a warning. I'm gonna fail the pipeline if a GPL license of any type is being used. And then I can also put in about the, uh, I have another, con another uh, license related one. Uh, if it's strong, copy left, or weak, copy left, um, I'm, I'm throwing a warning. So um, going back to looking at Flask, no, no, no. Let's see here. Let's just look at React here. All right. Actually, sorry, I want to apply my policy. So I have defined a policy that uses all those four rules as my company intake policy. And I'll go ahead and go back to my Flask one a second ago, just because I... So this time, I can see here that I got one warning that was triggered, but all the th other three other ones passed. So this is a way of automating that, that intake policy process using your policies. So that's, that's cool. But what if I'm just, you know, I don't want to be in the tool itself. I'm, I'm actually just going to a code repository and I'm wanting to, to find out, you know, what's going on with, with Flask in, in the repository itself. So we have a, a plugin that you can just click on. And again, it gives you that feedback right away about that particular project. Um, I'm also able to, again, get my policy enforcement information right here. I had that one warning. And if I want to, again, go back to the, the, the full bore set of metrics associated and information associated with it, I can just click that button and go there. So, you know, they, the idea is, again, get it to the point where the developers can easily find out when they're looking for information. You can, you can scan for the uh, different kind of components that you want within Open Source Select, um, or when you're in a code repository with the plugin, 
be able to get that information immediately as far as whether or not it's uh, a concern or not. So um, anyway, I, you know, I thought that would be helpful to, to show you than, than just tell you about it. <laughs> um, so in conclusion, again, I, we, we really feel strongly that the automation of this process is going to make a big difference as far as reducing some of that pain on the intake process. And, you know, if, if you can get that 27% closer to 100%, I think that's going to save a lot of time, reduce frustration of your developers, and, you know, there are a lot of benefits to help with your productivity. Yes, got a question. I mean, are you reflecting on the fact that the maintenance of the components themselves and are tracking how well they're being maintained? Yeah, so I guess, you know, you can, you can find out whether or not there's a very active community or not. And, you know, one of the things that, um, yeah, just as, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. Um, so you're familiar with um, TensorFlow? And so... You know, TensorFlow had a, a lot of activity early on. Um, and so there, there were a lot of pull requests that were done. And there, there were large pull requests, too. And I think as a result, you, you can see here that the bugs rating, you know, bug um, reporting s score is really low um, because of the fact that it has such a high number of bugs. Um, and, and you would be able to potentially estimate, you know, you see, see from that kind of thing whether or not, you know, that behavior of the community or what's happening might lead to this kind of result down the line because, you know, the fact that you have fewer people with eyes on these large thousand line code submission, you know, pulls and or submissions, right, um, might result in, in higher bugs. Um, but again, that, that's more of an analysis and understanding of potentially how to use that tool in that way. Um, but I don't, that doesn't solve the problem. It maybe gives you some insights. Yeah, and you might be able to again track the community health if they if you start seeing that ultimately that that contributor starts falling off, um, then you can start saying, okay, hold it, this is getting fragile, and is it going to get abandoned? You know, I mean that's that's the thing you may be. But again, part of that challenge is also how often do you go back? Right, right, and you and may be able to say we're done. Log4j was done a long time ago. We're good. <laughs> yes, sir. So the open source select tool is primarily focused on the vulnerabilities that are exposed, as well as the you know the the the, the ability the, the rat, how quickly they're resolved. You know they're they're tracking that. In the SCA tool, the software composition analysis tool, you'll actually get that insight as far as the releases and which ones are are showing more security. How actually when to apply those um, future releases based on the uh, security status. Um, so, 
you, you, you'd have more insight with the SCA tool as opposed to you know, the open source select. I mean, open source select is giving you some information to make a decision whether or not to bring it in. But as far as some of the other aspects that we were asking about, it would be the SCA tool. Right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so in the in the 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 survey, the impact was, you know, again, depending on the the, the scale of the, of the question, um, you know, very negative, negative, you know, so it, it was just a a, a scale, and, and so that was really just how they were trying to, you know, basically determine that impact was um, judged by whoever the participants' response was on that scale. Yeah, so they, you know, they did have like a, a section of questions around automation as far as what they felt, whether or not they would help with the process or not. But that was a separate set of questions from trying to determine the, the, uh, the impact of, of non-compliant components and what ramifications that had on the organization. So um, some of the questions were like, for example, um, you know, what kind of impact did it have on um, the, the I actually, let's just bring it up. I think it actually has the questions listed on there, but I can also give you the report. Um, so let's see. That one didn't have the question on there. I'm sorry, they, they don't have the questions. I thought they had it on there uh, under some of the, uh, the headings there, but um, I can provide the link to the report as well. Actually, so if you if you come down to our booth, we you know we have a, a, the ability to get you that information as well. So um, we have the open text booth down there, and we're we're we got a, a, a debricked um, shooting game as well. You can you can win a prize, um, but yeah, we we have that available to you. You can look it over then. And therefore, you respond in a negative way that day. <laughs> yeah, and, and and this is a qualitative kind of survey, right? So it, it, that is true. Yeah. Right, but I I do think that the results reflect common sense as well, as far as some of the things. To your point. We could debate whether or not functionality should be the number one versus security, um, but you know that was what the results came out, and it could be different with a different set of participants. Um, but you, you're right in the sense that you know you're typically looking to do something, and you're looking for a certain kind of capability that might be the top priority. But if they get tripped up on a regular basis because of the security aspects, and that's where they're 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 feeling the pain because they're you know not really getting the information they need to be able to make the right decision, uh, and then they get you know, denied on a regular basis, that perhaps is why it was pushed up higher. Yeah. Oh, sure. All right, well, hey, uh, thank you. Oh, yes, a couple more questions. And a project is not onboarding themselves. So they're, you know, we have a, based on the SCA work, we have a whole database of all these open source projects. That's where we're pulling a lot of this information from. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then as far as the intake process for an organization, I guess what we're, we're arguing is that, you know, 
rather than going through something like this, um, where you're you're having to, um, you know, go through all these steps, the the developer is getting that feedback on the security compliance, the legal compliance, et cetera, up front. And so, you know, you, you're, you're able to get that because you've, 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 cod you've codified the rules of the policy in open source select. And so you're getting that feedback immediately to know that you're looking at a, comp a component that's going to be compliant or not. And if, for example, you say, I really, really want to take this on. I want to, I mean, I'm getting a warning here. Is it really a big deal or not? Maybe there's a process that you can get, you know, green light from, you know, one of these approvers, right? The open source project uh, program office. Um, it could be that you have a red, you know, some, something, but you really need that functionally. You, you need to have that, that, that component. So there may be another step that you have to go through to get that approved. But in general, we're saying you can automate this and get that, you know, feedback immediately that if it's going to be a problem or not, and move forward if it's all green, you know, or even if you, I mean, if the policy is that warnings are okay, but you have to be aware, you know, I mean, it sort of depends on how you want to handle those kind of uh, yellow lights, right? Um, but that, you know, the idea is that the an organization that's trying to make their intake process less painful could to empower the developers to make those decisions based on the feedback. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I, I think the, we have it the other way um, in the sense that we're estimating that, you know, again, developers are spending four or five days, uh, four or five hours per week dealing with intake issues. And it's probably dependent on where they are in the life cycle of the process, project, right? But th th there is, again, the survey was looking at the pain they're feeling. We don't have necessarily the outer, the other is, we have, we've only released this a week, a month ago. So we don't have the data saying that we have saved this customer this much time um, by, by using this automated process yet. So we don't have that data yet. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Right. That's what, we're, that's sort of like the, the data we're using for the machine learning that supports our SCA solution. I, I imagine the, you know, if, I don't have the answer for that. I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know if, for example, just this would be an empty screen or some kind of message that would indicate that we don't have information on that particular project. Um, and that I don't know either as far as whether or not we actually have some kind of feedback loop from the, the developer or the user to say, hey, you, this is missing. But that I'll ask the team. I mean, it's, it's the, 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 the database that we're using for SA is actively growing. Yeah, so that's, that's constantly growing. Um, and that's, this is tapping into that. Um, but to your point, it could be that it's missing something. Um, I, 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 I don't know if that's the case or how often that happens, but I, I can ask the team. It can get very complex, yeah. Well, like what we heard at the keynote, right? You know, all, all of a sudden something was open source and they flipped it over to a business license. Um, and you've made a decision based on two weeks ago. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there isn't any kind of, um, as far as I know, there's like, let's say you make a decision, right? And you, 
there's not, it's not, it's not tracking to say, okay, you've, you've used this compound. I mean, it, it might be in the SCA tool, right? If you would then, you would then be flagged as a potential license violation there because we have the same kind of policy enforcement we can do within SCA. And if something has changed and we're monitoring everything, that's where you find it. You wouldn't find, you wouldn't get any kind of notification from open source select because you've already gone through that process. Does that make sense? Yeah. And get a jury ticket, right. Right, just like our intake managers, right. Yeah, and I, and I think, again, um, depending on where you would run your SCA tool in, in your process, that's where we would fit in uh, to support your, 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 your process, right. Yes, sir. It's a, it's a combination, right? So we are also doing the, the, the binary scans and manifest scans, um, as well as just, you know, pulling from all the different projects. Yeah. Well, hey, thank you very much. Uh, again, we're downstairs. If you want to have an opportunity to, oh, upstairs. Sorry. <laughs> you can go downstairs, but you wouldn't find us. Um, but thank you.